Hi guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Anna. I'm a clinical psychology doctoral candidate. Today we're going to be talking about book recommendations, possibly one of the most highly requested videos. I am so thrilled that so many of you are readers and that you're interested in my book recommendations because to me, when you're asking someone for a book recommendation, that means I like the way you think. I would love to see how you got to this way of thinking. And I've been postponing it and postponing this video because I had a growing list of books that I was going to read, which I still have many of, but I realized that list is only going to get longer and longer and I should probably make this video sooner rather than later. So these are mostly books I read in 2020 and you know this past first month of 2021. I'm going to start with the psychology related books, then with some miscellaneous ones, so things like spiritual, historical, and feminist, and then I'm going to go into fiction. So let's get started with the psychology books. So the first one, and this is one of the top four I'm going to be recommending, Becoming Bulletproof by Evie Pomporas. I actually found out about her on the Women of Impact channel. Highly recommend the channel if you are not familiar with it. They have a lot of great inspirational psychological content. I finished this book in two days. I was glued to it. Um, she's a former Secret Services agent. She's also got a master's in forensic psychology, I believe. She saved people during 9-11. She's just a very tough cookie and incredibly inspirational. She's what law enforcement should be rather than what it's become, really. So the book is split into three sections. The first one is how to protect yourself, so dealing with fear, fostering resiliency, actual tips on how to protect your household. The second part is about reading people, so how to not fall prey to manipulation, the signs of deception. And the third one is about influence, how you can influence people and what you say, what you don't say, how you look, how you present yourself, and so forth. So I have a lot of notes from this book. I figured I would maybe read a few of them. Being willing to help others is the antidote to fear. Panic can kill you faster than whatever it is you're afraid of. Talks about the fight, flight, freeze response a lot. There are two types of regrets, those we have after doing something and those we have after not doing something, and the latter tend to haunt us more long term. She talks about something called mental endurance, mental armor. She talks about hormesis, I think that's how you pronounce it, I don't know. The body's strengthening response to the administration of low but incrementally increasing doses of stress. So this is the same concept as vaccines and the same concept as bodybuilding and it's also the same concept as exposure therapy. She says, fear is like a fire. If you extinguish it while it's small, it won't become an inferno. She talks about not being predictable, not responding to aggression in the same way every time when to react, being proactive versus reactive. She says 90% of protection is prevention. Oh God, there's just so, so many good notes in here. I don't even know how to decide what to tell you guys. There were a couple pages that I thought were really important for me personally that I think a lot of you would benefit from as well. So I'm just going to read an excerpt from that. Predators primarily seek out those they perceive as weak. The ones they think will go down easy, who won't put up a fight. It smells so good. Am I the only one that really likes to read books like every 30 seconds? You know why? Because they don't want a fair fight. They want someone they can conquer. They're looking for an easy target. Don't give them one. Most predators' modus operandi is to test you before deciding whether or not to attack. There is, however, a misperception about predators. We assume that they're strong and full of self-confidence. We conjure this grandiose dominant persona who can crush us. We project all our fears onto them, allowing them to take the role of predator while we volunteer to take on the role of prey. But the reality is that they are often the ones full of self-doubt and fear, which is why they choose those they think they are weaker than them. Predators prey upon others to conceal and compensate for their own insecurities. If they perceive you as strong and aware of your surroundings, aka a counter predator, they will move on to someone less likely to fight back. Therefore, when you're out in the world, present yourself with an air of vigilance and assurance. Walk with your shoulders back and head up. Don't be afraid to make eye contact with people. Show awareness. And if something doesn't feel right, don't neglect it. Beautiful. So highly recommend. Then there we have 
Women Who Run With The Wolves by Dr. Clarissa Pinkola Estes. This is an amazing book. It's on Jungian archetypal psychology archetypes. If you don't know, we've talked about it a little bit on this channel. They're kind of like mental images of people that we all tend to share. I like to think of them as personified schemas that really go across cultures and time. So we have the maid, the mother, the crone, we have the witch in the woods, the wounded healer, and so on. These are all examples of archetypes. Jungian psychology is quite interconnected with spirituality. Like for example, shadow work can be both psychological and spiritual. It can be seen as entering the underworld and also as entering the unconscious. So in that sense, I find this book to be not only very psychological, but also very spiritual. And I took, I think, even more notes on this one. It was just, so incredible, so many nuggets of gold in this one. Let's see what I can find. We all have a wild archetype inside ourselves that must be nurtured. Intuitive, sharp, prudent, predatory, keen. Women's curiosity or instinct is trivialized as snooping while men are called inquisitive. Consciousness of the inner predator allows you to then kill it. She talks a lot about trusting your intuition, which is again important both psychologically and spiritually. She talks about how you shouldn't leave your creativity neglected. She talks about writer's block. She calls it being frozen. Generally, a thing cannot freeze if it is moving, so move, keep moving. In other words, keep creating, keep being dynamic. She talks about how when we body shame women, we're actually shaming them for their ancestral line. We are shaming them for who they come from, from their ancestors. A woman's bodily self-hatred robs her of her creative life and takes attention from other things. Women who don't use their creative potential are like feral wolves or feral, I don't feral, I think. When the collective hates a woman's natural life, she must outlive, outthrive, outcreate those who vilify her. This one was really important because sometimes as a feminist myself, I get a little bit tired. This quote really drills in us that it's okay to be tired, but don't give up. Don't expect things to suddenly be okay. That's not gonna happen in our lifetime. It's not gonna happen in any lifetime. You have to keep fighting. So the note I wrote for this is, issues that entrap women's joy will always shift, but it is our job to respond with absolute stamina. When wolves are badgered, they don't say, oh no, not again, they fight. If we could realize that the work is to keep doing the work, we would be much more fierce and much more peaceful. She calls about burnout, which she calls hambre del alma, soul hunger. She talks about how when your creative ideas are incubating, it's not that you're having writer's block, it's just that you are kind of marinating and ideas are coming up and that's actually a very different feeling from being blocked, which as a writer myself, I completely understand. I can definitely sense when things are marinating for me rather than when I'm feeling stuck. She talks about forgiveness. She talks about female sexuality. Yeah, just great book, highly recommend it. <laughs> then we have A State of Affairs by Estelle Perel. So Dr. Perel, I don't know why we never call her doctor because she does have, I believe, a PhD in clinical psychology. She presents a very open-minded, almost radical view on infidelity. And I found myself struggling a lot with this book because I have a lot of ambivalence towards the ideas she's saying. On one hand, I felt like the questions she was posing were really important and brave. But on the other hand, I felt sometimes it was a little too enlightened, you know, a little too French. Well, she's Belgian, but you know, French culturally. <laughs> I just had some personal disagreements, but honestly, that's to be expected. You can't agree 100% with anyone and that's okay. I do agree that she's brilliant and she gives some beautiful examples of infidelity, beautiful as in beautifully written and evocative. And Canty, what are you doing? And she actually has a podcast if you are into listening to couples therapy. It's called Where Do We Begin? And it features actual couple therapy sessions, which I adore. As a clinician, I found it very helpful and I do highly recommend it. And I was actually talking to one of my friends, Toby, and he mentioned Esther Perel. He name dropped her and I thought, Come again and it turns out he knows her he's family friends with her and that blew my mind and then the last psychology related book that we're going to talk about is the immortal life of henrietta lacks by rebecca sklute 
So actually I read this book as part of my diversity class in grad school, but I do highly recommend it if you want to learn about some of the racial atrocities that have happened in this country on women of color, people of color, by doctors. So it is historical, but it is also beautifully written and important to know about, especially if you're in a medical field. We really need to know what the medical field has been built on. So moving on to kind of miscellaneous, spiritual, historical, feminist books. I don't know why I really didn't separate them into more specific categories. I think I just want to make sure everyone gets a little bit of everything because I don't know what you guys are most interested in. I've spoken about this book multiple times. Rage Becomes Her, The Power of Women's Anger by Soraya Shemily. I actually have an entire video on this book, so I will put a card somewhere up here. It's written by a feminist I very much admire, but the video I made was really only about one of the chapters in this book, which is Tips for Angry Women. Unfortunately, I didn't take notes on this one because if I had, it would have been this long. Honestly, it's filled with so much gold, so many psychological references and statistics to remember. I'm definitely going to need to reread it at some point because I feel like everything in it is so important. I really need to ingrain it into my long-term memory. So I loved it so much, I actually shipped a copy to my mom too. Highly recommend it. Then we have Thracian Magic by Georgi Mishev. So it's translated from Bulgarian. I actually wanted to learn about my Thracian Dacian ancestors as a Romanian, but I could find almost no books in Romanian or from Romania, so I settled for our neighbors who I have a great deal of affection for. It's a mix between anthropology, history, and spirituality. It talks about both historical magic practices from the Mal Balkan region as well as practices that are still practiced today, and you would think that's not the case because it is predominantly Christian, but these traditions do outlast the times. So it's a good book. I recommend it. It is slightly difficult to read at times because of the translation, I think, but it's definitely interesting. Then we have Last Days at Hot Slit by Andrea Dworkin. So this is a piece of radical feminism and to be honest with you, I'm starting to identify more as a intersectional radical feminist rather than simply an intersectional feminist, and I have my reasons for that. Um, I won't lie, it's a pretty tough read, some pretty graphic scenes. Um, it's brutal because it's supposed to make you uncomfortable, it's supposed to bring attention to the atrocities that women have faced. So it's not for the faint of heart what, whatsoever, not for women who have been particularly traumatized in their lifetime. You know, I've heard that Dworkin is controversial, but I gotta be honest, based on what I've read so far, I don't see why. She seems to be an ally to people of color, she acknowledges that for some women, other identities are more oppressive to them than their gender, which to me sounds like intersectionality. She defends trans people, she speaks out against homophobia. I don't see any evidence of her being a trans exclusionary radical feminist. Certainly, if there's something I don't know about, let me know. I don't even know that she has ever been accused of that, but I think it's a good piece of work. I just think it's brutal. Like, I won't lie, I'm trying to race through it. I just have like 10 pages left. I'm really trying to get rid of this as soon as possible because it is horrifying. And I think the reason radical feminism strikes me recently is because I talk about this in my dissertation. Empowerment has multiple layers. It's like an onion. It's not just a subjective feeling of empowerment. You could feel super empowered, but not be empowered. There's also, you know, the interpersonal layer. Like, do you feel comfortable setting boundaries with other people? There's also the macro layer. You know, do institutions, does the government, does society on a mass scale respect your life, respect your humanity, respect you as a human being as opposed to a sexual object? So I think the idea that empowerment is just a subjective feeling kind of ignores the other layers and doesn't really produce any constructive change. And I think also, if you're familiar with the sex wars, that's in the 70s, uh, liberal sex positive feminists were battling it out with radical feminists. And I think that the reason liberal feminists won was because when you read the work of someone like Andrea Dworkin, you were really struck by the trauma and I think if you just see it on the surface level you think oh well, she's sex negative, she hates sexuality. That's not the case at all. The case is that she's been traumatized 
so severely that it's a trauma reaction. We should really be more compassionate to people who have had that experience rather than simply labeling them as sex negative because they disagree with your views on feminism. Then we have Jailbreaking the Goddess by Lasara Firefox Allen. So this is written from an intersectional feminist lens, but also archetypal, like we were talking about with the Jungian um, women who run with the wolves book. So the archetypes discussed here are about the triple goddess moon framework. So this is three archetypes of the maid, the mother, and the crone. It's a really quick, easy read, and it's kind of about the misogyny present in the triple goddess moon symbol, how reducing a woman's value or identity to her reproductive phase is quite reductionist and insulting. And I really appreciate the symbol of the triple goddess moon in the sense that I'm someone that loves change. I love the change of the seasons, I love the change of myself, I love the change of the world, and the waning and waxing of the moon in its phases is to me very symbolic of how life ebbs and flows and things are always changing, but I do have to agree that it is a very reductionist symbol in terms of female identity if you really look at what it's based on. And again, you know, I don't agree with everyone. Like in this case, I did feel at times that she was trying too hard to be enlightened, like saying the types of things that people, you know, make fun of social justice warriors for, like apologizing for using the word decolonize because she's white. But, you know, overall, I don't have any major complaints with the book. It was a quick, easy read. And she presents her own five goddess archetypes, which were interesting because, you know, I'm not really interested in worshiping that or anything like that. This to me clearly reads like a piece of fiction because that's what it is. She's coming up with archetypes, but it is based on pre-existing goddesses historically in all parts of the world. So I think that's great. It's, it's interesting. It's not something I would personally partake in, but if you're interested in that, I think it's great. Then we have this beautiful book. This is like going to a museum. It's called A History of Magic, Witchcraft and the Occult by DK? I don't know, I think that's the production company or something. So I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. My novel will be witchcraft related and I am so excited for it and I've been doing a lot of research and this book has been a gold mine for my research and it goes across thousands of years and dozens of cultures looking at the ways people practiced magic historically and presently. Things you would not even think of, like if you're Romanian you might know the concept of Marcișoare. Uh, we wear them in the first week of March to celebrate the coming of the spring. Another example of, you know, unexpected magic, my grandma always tells me on New Year's Eve to put basil under my pillow so that I will dream of my future husband. She says that worked for her when she met my grandpa. Even something like wearing a lucky item so that your favorite sports team wins. All of these are examples of day-to-day -day magic and traditions. And when people vilify magic, it's because really they don't understand it. I cannot recommend this book enough. I have pages upon pages of notes on it in my book of shadow. I mean, in my other mental health journal. So highly recommend it. And then my last miscellaneous book, <laughs> I took its cover off, but it's called The Princessa Machiavelli for Women by Harriet Rubin. It's again, small book, pretty easy, quick read. It combines feminism and emotional intelligence. To tell you the truth, I think I read this in 2019, so I might be cheating a little bit, but I can't remember a goddamn thing about this book. I remember that I learned from it and that it seemed interesting at the time, but I do remember just kind of feeling this is too much along the lines of, we're women, we have to take the high road. That to me is uh, not what Machiavellianism is about at all. Certainly she's redefining the word and that's great. I think Machiavellianism is not something we should aspire to. Um, but at the same time, I don't like this double standard that women are held to. Moving on to fiction, Dracula by Bram Stoker. Minus the occasional racism against Eastern Europeans and Romani people. It's beautifully written, an absolute Gothic classic and will always hold a dear place in my heart. And actually, I just learned this from this book. Bram Stoker was actually in a magic cult, the more you know. So I also highly recommend the 90s movie about Dracula with Winona Ryder. 
Um, although they do kind of change a few things. Like they romanticize the relationship between Mina and Dracula when in the actual novel, it's not a love story. He just wants to kill her. Then we have Dracul by Bram Stoker's nephew, I believe, J.D. Barker. So this is a, both a prologue and an epilogue to Dra epilogue, epilogue. <laughs> It's a prologue and an epilogue to Dracula, I guess. It goes back and forth in time. It's okay, you know, it's fine. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. And actually, there is a little bit of racism in this one as well, except this time, several generations later, the racism really has no reason to be there because we live in a completely different world where some of the things that Bram Stoker said are you know not as societally accepted so why would his nephew be saying things that are even worse doesn't make a whole lot of sense also it's not quite as beautifully written i can't say i recommend this one too much unless you're a dracula fanatic in which case you should get it going along with the theme of vampires we have the historian by elizabeth kostova this might be my favorite writer and book at this moment when I tell you reading the imagery felt like tasting the actual scene, I was salivating at the mouth over how vivid everything was. And it also takes place in multiple countries across Europe, so there's quite a bit of history and travel involved. My only complaints were that the ending was a bit anticlimactic. It jumps between two narratives, which can be confusing. And after a certain point, the details just get a little bit too much to the point where you wish the story could pick up the pace a little bit. Um, but I don't know, I might reread it at some point. It's almost 700 pages. But yeah, I might reread it at some point because it is so beautifully written and it is exactly the type of style that I like to write in. Then, if you like that one, we have The Shadowland, also by Elizabeth Kostova. This one's not fantasy, but rather historical fiction. It also goes back and forth between modern times and a Holocaust survivor's story. It's also beautifully written, but I have to admit, I prefer her fantasy over her fiction. She drops little hints of fantasy in this one, but it doesn't actually amount to anything fantastical. So to me, it feels like a little bit of a cop-out. Then I don't actually have this book on me, but it's Wildwood Dancing by Juliette Marie. I don't know why she has a French name. I think she's from New Zealand. But anyway, it takes place in Transylvania. It combines a whole bunch of different fantastical legends like vampiricism, other elements as well. It's technically young adult. I did read it in my teens, but I loved it. And I still think I would read it because it is beautifully written and it is very mysterious. And if you like that one, this is the continuation, Cybelle's Secret, also by Juliette Marie. So it's a continuation of the one I just mentioned, Wildwood Dancing, but it takes place in Turkey. It's actually funny because I have a friend named Cybelle and she's from Turkey. So if you don't know, the cult of Cybelle is actually an interesting piece of history, which is also in here, by the way. It keeps showing up in a lot of the books that I've been reading. Um, so in the cult of Cybelle, the priests used to castrate themselves in honor of the goddess Sibel as self-sacrifice. So it has a lot of feminist undertones in all of the different people who write about this cult. Then we have Once Upon a River by Diane Setterfield. This one is well written. She's a beautiful storyteller, but she's constantly changing the narrator and the amount of characters was a little bit confusing. So every chapter is written from a different character's point of view. They're not necessarily important characters, but they do kind of change the tone. If I'm being perfectly honest, I was kind of racing through it and not really paying attention to the plot line too much, but I do really like her voice. She is a beautiful writer. If this one speaks to you, I do recommend it. Then we have Magic Lessons by Alice Hoffman. And I thought that this cover looks like my friend Jess, but Jess is obviously more beautiful. So it's a story about an English witch who moves to Salem. It's beautifully written. However, I wish it were a little slower paced. Because it happens over the course of like three decades and it's written in pretty big font. And there's a lot of symbolism about how Women have been persecuted as witches for centuries because people fear what they don't understand. Um, it has a lot about, you know, religious persecution. I believe Alice Hoffman herself is 
Jewish of origin, I'm not quite sure. All her books are about witchcraft, so it's kind of hard to say. Um, but either way, either religion, pick or choose, is pretty persecuted. Then we have Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami. He's very famous and renowned. The story takes place in Japan. I liked it, I do recommend it. However, I will say it seems a little overrated in my opinion. There's the pacing kind of jumps around and not all the storylines within it connect very coherently, but I did like it. It made me cry, very heartfelt reading. Actually, it made me cry a lot and he's a great writer. So yeah, if you like it, take it. Then there's 50 great short stories and anthology. Um, some of them are a little bit outdated. But what I like about these collections is that if you don't like one of them, there's always a chance of liking the next one. And this one smells amazing. So some of them did influence me as a writer, so I, I do recommend it. They are classics, even if some of them are a little outdated, not too much my style. Also, they're good if you like short stories, especially ones on the longer side. Now, I don't have this one on me, but I have to reread it soon, so I might order it to have it here in Chicago. I used to say it was my favorite book for the longest time, and possibly after I reread it, I might start saying that again. A Thousand Splendid Sons by Khaled Hosseini. From what I can remember, it's about two wives in the Middle East, a kind of jumps narrator, and I think they believe, I believe they have the same husband, and they're both dealing with that situation, which is not a great situation that they're going through, and it's just such a beautifully written, dark, but feminist book. It's so apparent in the way Hosseini writes about women that he's really an ally and really understands the female experience. And that is so refreshing in comparison to how most male writers write about women and reduce us to our bodies. And what takes the cake as the worst piece of fiction I have read in 2020, the only book I could not finish and still refuse to finish. The Mist by Stephen King, paralleled only by the movie, which I watched ironically after starting this and cracked up. Doesn't even smell good. No, don't recommend this worst book of 2020. Hope this was helpful. If based on all of my recommendations, you have any recommendations, please put them down below. If I were to say my top four favorite, I would recommend Women Who Run With The Wolves, Rage Becomes Her, oh, Becoming Bulletproof, and A History of Magic, Witchcraft, and the Occult. Hope you enjoy. Let me know if you get any of these and what you think about it. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe and see you soon.